Welcome to the Entrepreneur's MBA, bringing you lessons from real-life entrepreneurs they don't teach in business school. Here's your host, business coach and marketing strategist, Adam Kipnis. Hello, hello. Adam Kipnis, host of the Entrepreneur's MBA podcast here, lessons they don't teach you in business school. Uh, Today, I'm excited to have uh, the chief storyteller at Simply Video. Co. Uh, I'm really excited to hear uh, what he has to say about being the chief storyteller and what that means and, and how it's led to business success for him. But I'd like to introduce Kay Lawrence from simplyvideo.co. Kay, how are you? I'm fantastic. Adam, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. Very well. Um, Kay and I actually met um, through sort of inter- the internet networking app Shaper, S H A P R, for all you. Uh, networkers and entrepreneurs out there. Um, it's actually a, a, uh, a great little app where you meet like 10 or 12 people per day and, um, and start good conversations. Um, so I want to start with the chief storyteller side. We'll, we'll get to a little of your story, Kay, but wh- why did you choose chief storyteller as your title? Yeah, great question. So, you know, for me, as long as I can remember everything about my life, I've always been very interested in the power of stories. Uh, and so, you know, growing up, I, I did come from a, uh, a place of faith growing up. So, you know, I would hear a lot of different parables and, you know, a lot of different stories. And I've, they've always been able to transcend in a way that I thought was very interesting, you know, because I feel like a lot of times we get caught up and we get busy in life. But a great story does something uh, that nothing else can do, which is get people to actually, like, stop and think and really consider things. Uh, and so for me, stories have always been a, a really good tool to to reach people where they are. Uh, and so for me, you know, I've always been a lifelong student of stories. And so the chief storyteller title that I operate under is pretty much synonymous with our brand. Uh, Simply Video is a brand that's dedicated to finding a story uh, and telling that story through video and, you know, video strategy and video marketing uh, for small businesses. And so... Uh, As the chief storyteller, it's my job to make sure that we're always doing that for our clients. And more importantly, you know, we deliver on what we say we can deliver. Very cool. And I know in in working with small business owners myself, a lot of times they know what they do very well. They just have difficulty in telling other people. So how do you help them tell that story? How do you help them really uncover what that story is? Right, and you said it best. You know, for the most part, you know, uh, business owners really do have a great idea of what they want. But when it comes to communicating that, uh, sometimes you're so close to the story that you could be too detailed. And so what we like to do is kind of get them to take a step back, uh, really understand what they are trying to say. Uh, We have a lot of uh, processes and things like that in place when we onboard clients uh, that we really, really make them think about their goals, uh, you know, they, we need to know about where they work a few years ago. Uh, you know, what are you doing today? So it, it really is a, a, a lesson of getting them to think. Uh, and once we do that, you know, it's easy to find that story. And once we find that story, we can build around that. And, and when you started your businesses, and, and you've had several, this is not your first entrepreneurial venture, you've had several how did you, how did the story come to you, the idea of doing um, online videos and, and helping others tell their stories? Where, where did that idea come from? All right. So, uh, so contextualize this. Uh, I graduated from a, a college in Orlando, Florida called Fulton University. I received my associate's degree for film production, uh, but also have my bachelor's uh, for business management and entrepreneurship. And so for me, the role that led me to the place of, you know, storytelling and really wanting to create a a brand and a a service that allowed uh, people to tell their stories online through video, it was just a consistent need and consistent feedback. I think feedback is the most important part to listen to, uh, you know, and just hearing people uh, from all over the world. You know, I've been very fortunate to work on the film side of things. I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, doing work with them. Uh, so, you know, I would also do local things. So, you know, just taking all the feedback that I heard collectively, you know, learning here and there, 
in the way the internet is shaped these days, my partner and I thought it would be a great idea to, to service the need of the people who couldn't necessarily afford, you know, a $5,000 budget or $10,000 video. Uh, and that's what Simply Video was about. Uh, and that's why we started was to be able to give them the ability just to have the uh, resources that would need to tell their stories. Cool. And, and a lot of people with your background and, and going to school for film um, get on a plane, leave Orlando, go to Hollywood and work slave labor for a long time before they finally get their big break. You did actually right. move to L.A., which is where you live now, but you took a different <laughs> yeah. path. <laughs> Why did you go the entrepreneurial path versus going to the big motion picture world? You know, it's, so one, one of the things I realized very quickly about film, as much as I loved it, I knew that it was a very slow, uh, more of a hurry up and wait process, what they say. So, you know, you do a lot of work up front, but it still takes a lot of, you know, magic to make that happen. Whereas in the entrepreneurial world, if you wake up, if you work hard enough, if you're consistent, you can move a little bit faster and really kind of control some things. So, you know, as much as I love film, and I still do film to a certain degree today, uh, it's just I, I, the world of film is slow, and the world of entrepreneurship is, you know, a much more uh, in-control process, right? If I get up every day and I make a certain amount of phone calls, if I contact enough people, if my value is there, I'm going to make some progress. Film, not so much. You need, you know, a little luck. You need uh, connections. You need a lot of money. Uh, so the entrepreneurial world for me was more appealing, and also because of my father. My father was a uh, successful uh, executive at a, a company called Habitage Furniture, uh, and so you know, just being a young guy, being around him, hanging out at his store uh, in, a, in the break room while he was at work, and just having a host of conversations about financial education and business ownership, I've always leaned more so uh, on the side of entrepreneurship, and so. After I graduated with my film degree, I always thought of film more so as a, I don't want to say as a product or a service that I could sell, but all, I, I did. You know, that was the whole thing. A lot of people kind of look at film and say, oh, it's creative. But for me, I look at it as no different that you would sell anything else. Uh, and so, you know, it's really about being able to sell it the best. And that's something that I think we do very well. And you said something really interesting there. You, you said that, going the entrepreneurship route gave you more control over your success or over your destiny. M many people are raised with the, the idea or with the thought process that being an entrepreneur is risky. You see it the other way. Yeah, yeah, I do. And uh, so I think living in general is a risk. I mean, right. I could walk outside, walk across the street, get a cup of coffee and get hit by a car. But now it's probably a good chance that I won't, but you know, the risk has been mitigated by streetlights and crosswalks. So, you know, you have to find those mitigation points. And I think with entrepreneurship, uh, it's really about the least path of resistance, right? For me to make a movie or do something of substantial, you know, creativity on that level, you need a lot of money. Whereas entrepreneurship, to give you a prime example, my first company was started for $6,000. Uh, and that same year, we went on to make over $100,000. So, uh, you know, that, that alone is kind of the visual that I want to, you know, uh, portray here because even though you have to put in a lot of hours, you have to put in a lot of work, uh, you have to get a little bit of lucky, entrepreneurship gives you more control because you can literally pick up the phone. You could always find someone's email. You can always go to some event uh, that's going to lead to a sale, you know, and if you're consistent, uh, and if you're really passionate and you have something of value, uh, you're able to build and build and build off of that as opposed to having to wait on someone to green light or like to, to give you an opportunity. And it's funny, I talk to a lot of small businesses and startups and things like that. And, you know, it's this whole craze about raising money. I got to raise capital. You know, you hear about it all the time, everywhere. Like I raised five million bucks and those things are great. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's a very, very small percentage of the people uh, that are actually doing this. You know, if you really look at uh, the big picture, most entrepreneurs have the same story as me. They took a credit card loan or they got a loan from a friend or family and they started there, started small, stayed consistent. And uh, over the long haul, it becomes something way bigger than what they thought it was in the first place. 
So, so it's all about having an idea, picking up the phone or, or picking up your email and telling people what you're doing. Yes, it's really that simple because what I've learned is value is value. So, you know, you can talk to 100 people and you're going to get feedback. Uh, and if you don't make any sales out of 100 people, that's a good indication that maybe you need to switch your value proposition. It's not saying that you're a bad entrepreneur. It's not saying that your idea is not going to work. You just need the proper feedback so you can make those changes and get to a point of real value. And what you'll find is if you have value and you talk to people and they see that value, you don't have to sell them. If you just have conversations, they inherently see it. And that allows your business to grow. And, and when, when you have those conversations and, and people see it, you, you still have to ask for the sale in the end. And one of the things that many people really struggle with is asking for money. Was that something you had to overcome in your first ventures? Yeah. So for me, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a duality, you know, so for film related things, uh, you know, I've, I've had to raise money, uh, but when it comes to entrepreneurship, I've always used my own money. And I can't stress enough the difference between a, a film investor and a, a startup investor. I mean, there's two totally different worlds. But specifically about entrepreneurship, raising money, I've never actually successfully raised money like that. You know, I've, I've met with a lot of VCs. I've met with a lot of uh, angel investors. I've uh, met with a lot of different people who want to, quote, unquote, invest. But what I learned was the same amount of time and energy that was put in and trying to raise money from people, I could use that time more wisely and actually try to find customers and let the customers pay for my business. Because, again, if I'm adding value and it's needed, people will pay, and that's going to be sufficient to grow the business. Now, it also has to do with the original vision and the scale that you want to go to. I've always been very, very, very clear about where I want my businesses to go. I think if you don't have a clear understanding of how big or uh, the real market value and shares that you could get with your business, that's a problem. Because a lot of people, they think like, wow, okay, I could just raise five million bucks and once I get that money, I'm going to turn in a hundred million. Well, that's all relative because if your business is, a, is competing in a market that's already pretty heavily saturated, it's a very slim chance that you're really going to grow and, uh, you know, turn that, that capital into a much you know, bigger ROI. Uh, so I think it's very important to say, you know, okay, it, and it doesn't matter if you own a laundry service or a lawn care service, whatever the case may be, you need to understand and know where you want to go before you start walking down that path. And that's going to save you a lot of time and trouble. And it's funny, you also realize about what you honestly have to do to get there. Uh, you know, one of the biggest realizations that I, I, I had was from a guy, I won't say his name, but he made a million dollars a year cold calling. And he gave me some advice one day. He, he was just like, when I wake up in the morning, I don't say I want to make a million dollars. He says, I know for a fact if I make 100 phone calls a day, I'm going to make a million dollars. And it's just the law of averages. So it, it's knowing where you want to go. It's knowing the steps that, that it takes to get there, and then it's actually doing them. Yep. And it, it, it's interesting you said, as, as you were talking, I, I was thinking, um, you know, having your story and, and having your plan is critical. It's one of the, the first things I coach on with, with my clients. Um, but when, when you're in a noisy market like video, um, there's a lot of people out there who, who say they do videos. There's a lot of people out there who do, um, I'm putting sort of air quotes around social media marketing, and, right. and videos are a big part of that. Um, so part of your story and part of that, that plan that you put together has to be your differentiating qualities. What yeah. are your differentiating qualities, and, and how did you and your team come up with them? Great question. And what I always say uh, is if you look at like an Airbnb or an, an Uber, you know, you think these companies are like, you know, years ahead of, of like the usual thing or like they're just super innovative. And they are in their own right. But the reality is this. People have always had extra space in their homes. People have always had a car and they were going a certain direction. The beautiful idea of what they did to find the niche that allows them to grow and be the doing all the companies that they are is they took something that existed 
something that was very familiar, but they put a, a unique twist on it, right? So if you look at Uber, if I needed a ride, I could have easily called a friend, but Uber made an infrastructure around it. So it's about finding that niche, finding that unique proposition. And so for us, uh, the subscription video model is unheard of. There's no company besides ourselves currently that does that. Now, it takes a lot of work. We have to make a, a lot of investments to be able to service at scale. But our unique value proposition is, as opposed to paying, you know, five to ten grand or whatever the case may be to get a high-quality video, to get video strategy and all these things, it's much better to build a relationship and do a subscription model. Now, you know, we've only been in the business about a year, so we'll see you know, if we continue to grow. But, you know, this first year we've grown. You know, we've made a lot of great relationships. We found that we are a valuable option. And it's, it's different, you know, it's different in terms of how we operate. And, and, and different, uh, one of my uh, a friend and, and sales coach, guy named Gene McNaughton, once said, different is better than better. And, and I love that quote in that so many people want to be better than everybody else. But if you right. do something a little bit different, obviously you can, you can attract more of the marketplace. And, but I want to come back to the subscription model because subscription businesses obviously um, have more regular cash flow, have um, not as much lumpiness or, or, or spottiness in their business because every new client is going to keep paying them month after month. Why did you choose that, that subscription model? Right. So for us, if you think about the cost of video, the biggest problem is that it's very cost upfront heavy, right? You have to have the equipment. You have to have the people. You have to have the experience. It's a lot of things that just cost a lot of money up front. Uh, so, you know, when we were doing our models uh, and breaking down, like, cost structures and things like that, it actually made sense to where if we had different plans uh, and gave them the same value, and if we added value to their business in a way to where they needed us, you know, we would make the same amount of money just over the year from the same customer. Uh, and so what that does is two things. So the customer, they don't have to take on a real large burden of spending a lot of money up front without uh, jeopardizing what they need, which is, you know, consistent, high-quality communication. And then for us, that allows us to build a system and work with a lot of different people that need the same service without it being a one-size-fits-all scenario. Uh, so the subscription model for us works very well because it enables the people who really do need these things, the e-commerce brands, the startups, the small businesses who don't have a lot of money you know, to compete. They may have a very valuable product or service, but if people don't know about it, you won't grow. Uh, and so this goes back to my title as Chief Storyteller. It, it really is about building a system that allows people to communicate that uh, in a very unique way. And that's why the subscription model allows us to do so, uh, because it gives us the flexibility to deliver the high-quality content and it out, without having to charge people you know, more, much more money than what they have uh, to spend comfortably. Very cool. And, and one of the things, it's easy to make a video, and that's not to say that it's going to be a great video, but anyone can today <laughs> take their phone and make a video of themselves. We see Facebook yeah. Lives and Instagram Lives every day. But what they do with that video is um, where, where most people fall short and, and don't understand how to monetize it. Now, on your website, which is simplyvideo.co, you offer a, a free video strategy as a way for people to get to know you and then, and then sign up for a subscription. Tell us a little bit, what is, what is a strategy around video? What does that look like and what does that mean? Yeah, and that's a great question because, so I'll answer that in two parts. The first part is this. When people say video, they, they tend to say it very broadly. When, when you think about where we are in the world, it's a very specific thing that video has to come, and it has many purposes. Uh, so if you think about the old way, you know, before the Internet and before social media, the most you could get from video would be maybe a, a nice local TV ad. If you had the money, you could run a national campaign. Those things were very expensive. But fast forward to where we are now, the TV has become a smartphone. The TV has become tablet. So... Uh, the need for video content has changed, and now you can use it for promotional videos. You, you can use it for customer support videos. You can use it for uh, demonstration videos. 
Uh, it's a hundred different ways to really use video to grow your business and make your business better. Uh, and so that's the first side of it. The other side of it is, uh, you know, just because you do video, that's not a strategy. The real strategy is the thought beforehand. You need to understand your audience because if you're selling to tweens, you know, the younger age group, and you're focused on trying to reach them through LinkedIn, that's not a very smart move. Uh, and so for us, it's the entire thought process from creation to delivery that we really, really make our customers think about. Uh, and then on top of that, with our services, we do a lot of research. We become a part of your team. We understand your market as well, and we collaborate uh, to the degree that we pitch you ideas that you should be giving to your customers. We give you ideas about where you should be placing your videos online. Now, it's always much better to collaborate because no one's going to know your business better than you. So, you know, you take our expertise and our experience, and you combine that with your knowledge of your, your customer, uh, you know, and then you have us go back and do some research. And that mix works very well for having a very successful video strategy that stands out. And so you deliver not just the what, which is the video, but also the how, which is the strategy as part of your overall offering. Correct. That's the most important part because without the, the video strategy, there is no what. Because if you are making video content just to be doing it, just to say you did it, it's not going to be as effective as you want to be. That's a guarantee. Uh, and we see this all the time. You know, a lot of companies that are coming from the retail world, they're becoming e-commerce companies and having to learn how to compete. And one of the biggest problems is those are two totally different worlds. What works in the retail world won't necessarily work online. So, you know, it's really about just understanding the scenario uh, and really having a great context to base things on. And once you have that, I think the strategy session and then the what becomes much more important. And, and, and going back to your first business, you said you started your first business with, with $6,000 and, and did revenue over 100 that first year. And, and this new business, you've had a great run in, in your first year, and it's continuing to grow. But we know, and the reason many people are listening to this, it is not because entrepreneurship and life are easy, but because there are roadblocks that we run into or, or there are things that, that we don't know that are holding us back. What's one thing that sticks out in your mind that, that you had to overcome, and if you knew about it beforehand, maybe you would have done some things differently? Oh, man. <laughs> Where can I start? Where can I start? The, the best advice that I would give to any entrepreneur is just because you make the sale doesn't mean you have the money. Uh, and a lot of times companies get in trouble because, you know, they go out and they successfully get people to say, yes, okay, I like your service, I see the value. I'm going to do business with you. But until that money hits the bank, you can't spend it. Uh, and so a lot of companies, what they'll do is, you know, they'll have, like, you know, sales team go out. You know, they'll have the, you know, the good interaction. But until that money comes in, it's just not yours to spend. So you have to manage your cash flow above all. That's the biggest roadblock that I've ever had in my life is just, you know, like, the frustration that comes with, okay, like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I made the sales that they've committed, but in the meantime, I still have to pay people. I still have to keep my business running. So, you know, just always realize that it's going to be a period of time between the time they say yes and the time the money actually hits the bank because cash flow is always going to be king. The day you can't make payroll, the day you can't pay your internet bill, then things get really, really messy. So, you know, and it's coming from a place of that actually happening before, you know, it's just a very scary situation to be in because it's confusing. It's not as if your business is not working. It's just a matter of the cash flow and how you manage things. So my big advice would be understand that even though you got that yes, it does not matter until it's in the bank, period. <laughs> That's great advice. <laughs> that is really great advice. Um, well, one last thing for me, and, and this is something I find from a, a lot of different entrepreneurs is, is there's a charitable side. There, there's a way that they give back. Uh, I'm, I am the co-chairman of a, a bicycle ride here in Arizona to raise money for diabetes, and I was looking through your LinkedIn, and you're the chairman of a um, Film for Food Foundation in, I believe, in Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about it, and, and how did you uh, 
choose that as a way to give back? Yeah, great question. So food and hunger is something that I'm very passionate about uh, because it's, it's two big reasons. A, I've actually experienced being very hungry growing up sometimes. Like I had very hardworking parents. My parents uh, were divorced when I was younger. So I grew up working with my mother in terms of my day-to-day life. You know, she was a woman that worked two to three jobs. And sometimes, no matter how hard you work, it's just you fall short. And so it would be moments where my brothers and I, you know, we didn't have food or, you know, we had to eat the same thing for a week. Uh, and then fast forward to college, you know, college life is just crazy, eating ramen noodles every day and, you know, having to live off of dollar cheeseburgers from McDonald's isn't the most healthy thing to do. Uh, so, you know, just experiences like that, you know, inevitably shape how you view things. Uh, and so just the kind of person I am, I'm very passionate about food, and I'm also very passionate about waste. So, you know, if you look at the statistics, a lot of the food that we produce here locally is wasted. And it's insane when you think about the fact that, wow, like, there's so many people in the world that won't eat today. It's literally people that will actually starve today, and we are throwing away thousands of pounds of food. So, you know, just coming from that place and using what I have, which is my ability to produce video, uh, to tell stories, find stories. The Film and Food Festival is a festival dedicated to uniting filmmakers and artists, uh, allowing them to showcase their work. And all the proceeds, all the proceeds that come in from the artist entry fees to compete in the festival, along with the uh, audience fees for attending the festival, all that money is do- donated to local charities uh, in certain areas. And so what that does is you get the best of both worlds. You get to expose uh, new people to new talent. And on the back side, when you make a little money, you get to make sure somebody eats tonight. And that's very important to me. Well, thank you for doing that. And thank you for telling everyone about about why and and what you're doing. So, I mean, I love the nuggets that you gave us. I mean, finding a, a, a mentor or finding someone that's done it that you can follow, picking up the phone, when and talking to a hundred people, if you talk to a hundred people, you'll have success. Know your strategy and, and and follow that strategy, and then tell your story through videos. And finally, cash flow is king because it keeps your business alive. Love yeah. all of the nuggets that you gave us. Any final thoughts? Uh, so, if I could give one final thought I, again, I would just say don't give up because. You know, entrepreneurship inherently, like you said, is just not easy. You know, you could you could hear my story, you could hear a hundred stories, and you say, "Wow, like they're doing it now." But it is a lot of dark nights. It is a lot of uncertainty. And so the reality is this: you just have to keep going because the day you quit really is the day that you actually fail. Uh, and the difference between failure and learning is giving up. You know, a lot of people they hit a roadblock or something doesn't go correctly or their customer that promised to pay you a week ago still has not paid and you still have to figure it out. Uh, and so I would just always say just keep going, you know, and always have people that are in your corner that you can talk to that will give you realistic advice uh, because you don't want a lot of yes people in your corner. You want people that say, look, uh, this is the situation. This is the reality of things. This is what you have to do to get to where you want to go. And, and then once you start going and you get that advice, you just don't give up. You know, it's going to get hard. It's going to be very uncomfortable at some point. But the morning always comes. And I know that may sound a little cliche, but that's the truth. If you keep going, you will ultimately reach that goal in some form or fashion. It may look a little different than what it looked like when you first started, but you can achieve whatever you want to achieve if you never give up. If you have the right mentors and advice in your corner, and you're very honest with yourself, I think you will always find a way to be successful. Thank you for that, and thank you for being here with me and telling your story. Really appreciate it. And to all our listeners, definitely um, go to simplyvideo.co. You can reach out to Kay there, find out more about his company, more about the videos that he has, and and take advantage of the strategy he's offering. Thanks, Kay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You've been listening to The Entrepreneur's MBA. Download Adam's free book, How to Make More Money in Your Business, at www.freebookfromadam.com.